Same thing. So we are today in Job chapter 36, and I'll read from the beginning. Elihu also proceeded and said, bear with me a little, and I'll show you that there are yet words to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker, for truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. My goodness, if you listen to Elihu, he speaks quite a lot. He's already spoken quite a few chapters. But now he says, I've just got a little bit more. There's always a bit more with this guy. He says, uh, bear with me a little and I'll show you. I'll show you that what? That there are words yet to be spoken on God's behalf. And that's quite a statement to make, that I'm speaking on behalf of God. There are a lot of people today who claim to speak on God's behalf whether they claim to be apostles or prophets, and they say things like, the Lord is just saying this, the Lord is saying that, and you have to ask yourself, are you sure you want to say that? Because you'll be held accountable for every word that you're saying. And Elihu is claiming here that I'm going to speak words on behalf of God. And that's quite a tall order. But then he goes on to say, I will also, I will fetch my, my knowledge from afar. And that just, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking how far people will go to get a word from God. Some people will go far across the seas to go to conferences and go to meetings. I've got to have a word from God. And yet they could go to God's word itself. Is that what he's saying, that I've gone a far away to get this knowledge? Or is he saying, right up into the heavens, as far as the heavens are above the earth, that's where I got my knowledge from, from God himself. Because he says, I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker. Well, that's a good thing. It's always good to ascribe righteousness. God is righteous. And so when you say that, is that to kind of back up the next statement to make you believe that what he's saying is true? Because he goes on to say, I ascribe righteousness to my maker, for truly my words are not false. That's also quite a claim. There's no falseness in what I'm about to say, because I'm giving you the pure word of God, straight from, the, straight from God himself, as it were. And what does he mean when he says, for truly my words are not false, one who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Now, if he's referring to God, that would be perfectly fine, wouldn't it? Is God perfect in knowledge? If he's saying, one, whoever that might be, who is perfect in knowledge is with you, or is he saying that I myself am one who is perfect in knowledge. And that, that's how it comes out in all the translations, as if he's saying, I'm one who's got it all together. And tell me, is there anyone that you know of, apart from God, of course, that says, I got it all. I, I have perfect knowledge of all things. Like, that's just too much. Seriously, no. I have never come across someone who's gone that far, really. Now, if he is really hearing from God, and if he is really speaking on God's behalf, you'd, you'd say, okay, we got to listen then, right? Well, what does he, does he say in verse 5? He says, Behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not preserve the life of the wicked, but gives justice to the oppressed. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but they are on the throne with kings. For he has seated them forever, and they are exalted. And if they are bound in fetters, held in the cords of affliction, then he tells them their work and their transgressions that they have acted defiantly. He also opens their ear to instruction and commands that they turn from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. But if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. Now, here is... Elihu is stating something about the way God deals with people. First of all, God is mighty. And though he is so great, so powerful, so awesome, he does not look down upon man like despising you insignificant little thing. He doesn't look down on us like that. He actually has compassion toward us. Okay. So although he's great, he looks at us with some kind of a, a care and concern for us. Listen to this. Um, he is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not preserve the life of the wicked. Um, that seems to imply that although he doesn't preserve the life of the wicked, he does preserve the life of those who are the righteous. Do you believe that God preserves us, that he holds us, that he protects us, and that he can do that? And he's, he, he's not doing that on behalf of the wicked. And yet he, uh, he does give also at the same time justice to the press. So perhaps in a sense, 
When God is not keeping his eye or uh, preserving the life of the wicked, it is so that the oppressed can actually go free from their control. And so let those wicked ones go and justice will be given to the oppressed. Now, verse seven, he says, he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but they are on the throne with kings. He has seated them forever and they are exalted. And if they are bound in fetters, held in the cords of affliction, then he tells them their work and their transgressions. Well, just before we get into that, did you think that God has his eye on you continually? Does he watch everything you do? Has he an interest in every move that you make? Well, Job had said this earlier on. I believe it was Job 8, verse 19, where he says, can't you even turn away your eyes, your gaze from me for a moment while I spit? I mean, come on. Why do you keep watching me? What is your big deal? You know, never mind big brother or big sister. I mean, this is it. You've got to watch the, the eyes of people, you know, lest they could be bluffing. You know, yeah, well, he, he, no, God is keeping an eye on us, watching our every move. And that's because he has a great interest in us. Listen to this. And um, he does not withdraw his eyes. And there are times whenever God's own people will go through different various uh, transitions in their lives. What's he mean? Now, he doesn't say who he has in mind, but during the history of Israel, now, we don't know exactly when these events took place, but during the history of Israel, there's one young man who went through various things, and you know him as Joseph, right? His, uh, he was sold into slavery. He was taken to Egypt. He was falsely accused, thrown into jail. And what in the end happened? He was brought out of the jail, and he was put on the throne, basically. He was made prime minister. He was made a ruler in the kingdom of Egypt. So you've got these things happening, and then he might be asking himself, why did all this happen? What have I done to deserve this? Do you ever read Joseph and wonder why did God put him through all? But of course you see the end result and you go, aha, there was a purpose behind it. But while at the time he'd be wondering what's going on. So when Elihu says this, he says that he seeks them forever and they are exalted. And if they're bound in fetters, held in cords of affliction, supposing that was happening, then it says in verse nine, then he tells them their work and their transgressions. That's a bit of a contradiction because that didn't happen in like, like, in the life of Joseph, he wasn't like doing so much wrong that he had to say, what have I done to deserve this? And God said, this is where you went wrong. But perhaps he saw it in the end, Joseph, as you know, he said to his brothers, what you planned against me for evil, God actually planned it for good that he might preserve us. That was the whole purpose of that. But there are other people who, when they go through afflictions and times of trouble, they may say to God, what have I done wrong? Maybe you yourself, maybe you've gone through some hardship and you said, have I done something wrong? Have I sinned in some area? What is the cause of this trouble? Well, it says in verse 9, then he tells them their work and their transgressions. I believe that in different translations, it comes out quite well. In fact, even better, it says, for example, in the NIV, tell them what they have done. Just God will tell them what they have done. Or the New Living Translation says, he'll show them the reason. And sometimes you'd like to know, okay, when did God ever speak and tell me what the reason was? Does God always tell us what it was and why we went through what we went through? We might come to the conclusion. But he says here that God will reveal all that to them and show them that they have acted defiantly. And then in verse 10, he also opens their ear to instruction and commands that they turn from iniquity. So in other words, through the affliction that they're going through, God gets a hold of people. Uh, he gets their ear. He gets their attention. And now some people don't like that. There is a theology that says God would never use affliction. God would never use suffering. He never does that sort of thing. But could, could God use affliction and suffering to get people's attention? Do you think so? How about Israel? Whenever they were end up going into exile, for example, in Babylon, and they're asking, where did we go wrong? Hmm, maybe it was it all that idolatry that we were involved in, and we should have turned away from that and come back to God. And so uh, the whole point is that you, when you start asking yourself, what am I going through? Why am I going through this? Have I done something wrong? And if God says to you, you know what? Yes, you have. And you were acting defiantly. You were disobeying me. And so the whole point of God's dealings is to bring us to a place of repentance. That's why he says, in verse 10, he also opens their ear to instruction and commands that they turn from iniquity. That's God's goal, to bring us back to himself and turn us from our iniquity. Now, verse 11 is an interest, 11 and 12. It says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity. That's not a 
a basis for preaching a prosperity message, but he is saying, basically, if you do what's right, you will live long and prosper. But if you do not, if you said, I'm not going to listen, I'm not going to listen to what God says, I refuse to hear, it says in verse 12, but if, you, if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. Now, I was reading that last night. I was uh, moved a little bit when I read that because I was thinking there are going to be some people. They are going to go through all the trials of life, hardships, difficulties, letdowns, breakdowns, um, their hopes dashed, troubles and trials. And they may even die young in life or die at an age just beyond before their time, perhaps. I never understand why. I, what was that all for? Because they're never going to find out. They're never going to know what it was about. They will die without knowledge. It may refer to the fact that they'll die unknown, but it, it seems to be saying that they will die without the knowledge. Whereas with God, I think that the truth of the for the believer is this. When we stand before him and he starts to reveal what it was was happening in our lives and he unveils the plan of God and the purpose of God, we might go, oh, now I see why I went through all of that, that you were actually working in my life. It's awesome to think that you were behind the scenes working. And uh, we just, we'll just be in tears probably. And that's why the Bible also says that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and they'll go, God, you're so wise. You're so awesome. I never saw it from your point of view. But for those people who are not believers, they may never find out. They may never know what was it and why did I go through all of that? But we know the reason is because they refused to turn to God. They refused to obey. Amen. Wow. So we're reading from verse 13. It says here, but the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. They do not cry for help when he binds them. They die in youth and their life ends among the perverted persons. He delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. Now, we just read there some, it's very similar to the previous verses. There are people who will receive instruction from God when God speaks. And there are other people who said, no, I'm not going to listen. And these hypocrites in heart, what they do, they refuse to come to repentance. And so what happens is, he says here, the hypocrites in heart store up wrath. Now, I was reminded of um, something that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, and I want to read I, wanted, I really wanted to read verse 5, but I might as well read from chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, because it kind of brings it all together. And Paul, writing about people in general, says this, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you, judge, you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of, this, of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But, listen to this, this is the verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. In other words, you're storing up for yourself just more of the wrath and the judgment of God against yourself, uh, against the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, on the Jew first and also on the Greek, but glory honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek for there is no partiality with God. You see, that's the way he's dealing with people all throughout this chapter in Job. He's dealing with people, whether they are his people, the righteous, or they, whether they are the wicked. And each will, will respond differently to God's 
dealings with them. If he deals with one, they go, I don't want to hear from God. I don't want to know what he's trying to say. I, I turn away from his instruction. Whereas the righteous person says, okay, God, I hear what you're saying. I believe you want me to come to repentance. I, I sense that I, I'm, I'm convicted and I come to repentance. And then God blesses that person and brings them to a, a prosperous and lively uh, life. Uh, in fact, he says there that they shall live long and their years and pl pleasures in verse 11. And what? was the opposite but the hypocrites in verse 13 in heart store up for themselves wrath and do not cry they don't cry for help when he finds them they die in youth in other words they die young and their life ends among the perverted persons perverted persons in different translations you'll read where it talks about the cult prostitutes and all kinds of abominable people and i was thinking about it also last night that there are there are going to be some nice people Oh, yeah, you meet them. They're very nice people. They're nice people. But nice people will end up with the perverts. Nice people will end up with sex offenders and with murderers and with thieves in the place of judgment, damnation, and hell. They're, nice people are going to be there. Why? Because they refuse to come to a place of repentance. Um, he delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. That's an interesting phrase as well, because he says, when people go through poor or, or, or poverty um, or affliction, God has a way of speaking to people in that. And it's very interesting how it translates verse 15 and opens their ear in oppression or by oppression. Whether it's what, you know, I don't know why this is happening to me, God, but in the middle of all of this, they cry out to God. And that is God's dealings. And that's why I messaged I call this message, you'd better learn your lesson. Because when God is dealing with us, we had better learn and say, God, what is it you want to get across to me? And I felt very sad for the fact that there's going to be some people who are going to go the way of all these lost people. And yet they were very nice in and of themselves. But God's going to um, hold them, hold them accountable in the end, right? Okay, so verse 16 indeed he would have brought you now this is where elihu speaks directly to job when he says this indeed he would have brought you out of dire distress into a broad place where there is no restraint and what is set on your table would be full of richness but you are filled with the judgment due the wicked judgment and justice take hold of you because there is wrath Beware lest he take you away with one blow, for a large sum would not help you avoid it. Will your riches or all the mighty forces keep you from distress? Do not desire the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, do not turn to iniquity, for you have chosen this rather than affliction. Now, as I have read through various commentators, uh, commentators and various footnotes in Bibles, there was such a variety of things on this because they said the Hebrew text is actually quite unintelligible in many parts of that chapter. And they said, it's very hard to understand what is being said there. But he certainly seems to be saying to Job, you didn't listen. And that's why God is bringing you through all these tests and trials because he wants to bring you to a place of repentance. But you're not listening, Job. And that's the whole point. Listen to that again. He would have brought you out of dire distress into a broad place where there is no restraint. Whereas if you read that in different translations, it is that God did bring him out. He has brought you out of this distress so that you would listen. But there's no way that you're going to get off the hook, no matter what money you've got or how much might or power you've got. There's no way of avoiding the, the, uh, the judgments of God or the, the stress that you're going through. But uh, it's very hard to understand. In fact, um, the last part of it there is where it does make a bit of sense. In verse 20 and 21, he says, Do not desire the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, do not turn to iniquity, for you have chosen this rather than affliction. Uh, he's saying, look, and that could be a message to anyone. Don't turn to things of the darkness. Don't turn to things of the night. Turn away. Turn to God instead. You think you can avoid affliction by turning to iniquity it's not going to work and that doesn't even make sense if you think about it so beware of turning to evil this is a different translation of the of the same text verse 21 beware of turning to evil which you seem to prefer to affliction beware of turning to evil 
which you seem to prefer to affliction? Or how about this? Be on guard. Turn back from evil. For God sent this suffering to keep you from a life of evil. Is that really how it works? That God seems to send suffering so as to turn you away from evil things? Take care and do not turn to iniquity. For this you have chosen rather than affliction. The ESV. Very hard to understand why he would say this to Job, but that's what he says. But it's a warning, I think, to every one of us to turn away um, from evil things. Turn away from wicked ways in our lives. Is that not a good sense, a uh, good message to preach to all people anyway, no matter where we are in life? No matter what you're going through, never turn to evil things as if that's going to relieve you from any sort of suffering. It's never going to help you. Again, as I said, it's a very hard to translate part of Job chapter 20, uh, 36. Now listen to verse 22. Behold, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? Who has assigned him his way? Or who has said you've done wrong? Well, that's an easy bit to really look at because he is simply saying, what? God is exalted by his power. There is none like God. And the thing is that he's so high, so mighty, and he is a uh, He's beyond anyone's questions. That's the whole point uh, that Elihu seemed to say, look, you don't question God. If, he, if you're going through something, you just exalt him, you praise him, you magnify him, and you accept the fact that there's nobody who teaches like he does. Is God ever teaching us things? Yes, he certainly is. He's teaching us, and we are not supposed to question it. But what's wrong with questioning? What's wrong with asking the odd question? Like Job is saying, why am I going through all this? Whereas Elihu is saying, you should never do that. Never question uh, because his ways are past finding out. In verse 24, he says, remember to magnify his work of which men have sung. Everyone has seen it. Man looks on it from afar. In the middle of all that Elihu is saying, there's a words of warning, words of encouragement. He also says, just don't forget to, to magnify and praise the Lord. Is it good to do that? Just to stop and say, yeah, I do magnify him. Listen to this. Remember to magnify his work. Even though you don't fully understand what's going on, you can say, I know God's at work in the universe. I may not be close up seeing it, but I can see it from afar. But remember this. Whenever Job was hit by the very first wave of uh, the troubles that came into his life, when he lost his family, when he lost all his cattle, his sheep, what was his response? Did he go... Why did you do this to me, God? Or did he start blaming the devil? Did he start pointing the finger and say, the devil, I bind you, I, I come against you? Did he do any of that? What did he do? You might want to turn back just briefly to Job chapter 1. It says, after all this, verse 20. Job 1, verse 20 says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. So he was a worshiper, even in the worst of times. And some people, they will, they will be thanking and praising God when good things happen. How many can do that? It's easy to say, well, thank God I got a big bonus this week. Or thank God I got a new car. Or thank God I, I bought a new house, whatever it might be. And thank God for all the blessings he's brought upon me. But how many of us can worship and praise God even when we don't know what's going on or whenever uh, things are going bad for us? Can we still worship God? That's the question. And that's what uh, Elihu says. Remember to magnify his work of which men have sung and do sing. Obviously, we did our praise and worship this morning. Everyone has seen it. Man looks from afar. Okay, our last little section of this chapter says this. Behold how... Behold, God is great, and we do not know him, nor can the number of his years be discovered. For he draws up drops of water, which distill as rain from the mist, which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. Indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy? Look, he scatters his light upon it and covers the depths of the sea. For by these he judges the peoples, he gives food in abundance, he covers his hands with lightning and commands it to strike. His thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm. Now, interesting how he brings about something about the greatness and goodness of God at the very end. First of all, he says, behold, God is great. 
Well, that's true. God is great and awesome. But listen to this. God is great and we do not know him. How many of you could say you know God? I remember saying to somebody in a meeting here one time at church, I said, well, you may know God, but we'll never fully know God. And this person said to me, oh, no, I don't believe that. I believe I will know God fully. I said, but you can't. How can we fully know God? God is unsearchable, unknowable. I mean, the depths of God's wisdom and knowledge are so profound that we could never for all eternity fully understand God. But we do know something about God. We cannot say when he says we do not know him. Listen to this. We do not know him, nor can the number of his years be discovered. Because this is speaking really about the eternality of God. I mean, think about it. God is eternal, having no beginning and no ending. How can we even conceive of that? What does that mean that God has always been around? He's not learning any new information, but he's always been there. He knows all things. He's more powerful than any being that ever existed or will ever exist. And yet he says, I'm just going to give you an example here of some of the things he, he does. And he talks about, from verse 27 to the end, about some phenomenon in nature, such as the hydrological cycle, which people haven't discovered for many hundreds and hundreds of years later. They didn't fully understand what was going on. And, of course, it talks there about the abundance of water falling. And you just think, yes, thank you. That's Ireland for you. We just have an abundance of water nonstop. And we don't want that. But... God is distilling the water. He causes the vapors to rise up. He disperses it. He flashes his lightnings. He directs his storms. And you know what? If you look around nature, a lot of people, of course, give the credit to who? Who gets all the credit when, when things? Who? Mother nature. Yes. Mother nature gets all the credit for all the things that happen. But, you know, even the creatures understand when a storm is coming. I was reading a little bit about the cattle. It says there in the very last verse, uh, his thunder declares it, and the, the cattle also concerning the rising stars. And apparently, yes, indeed, cattle know whenever a storm is coming, and they lie down in the fields, you know. And so if they can recognizing the coming storm, the coming uh, examples of God, you know, if that, if that was a, an example of God coming in his fury, in his wrath, in his power, in a storm showing flashes of lightning and peals of thunder, and you hear all that and you go, what does that re represent? It represents that God could come in so powerful judgments upon the earth, and the nature understands that, but how come man is not so concerned? He, does he not realize that there's coming a day when we're all going to have to stand before God and give him the kind of our lives and so the whole point of that i suppose is he's building up into his final speech in the the uh next chapter elihu talks more about the storms and things like that but the whole point here seems to be that job do you not realize that god is powerful and god is awesome god is a god who brings judgment and don't you realize that you need to get right with god well, of course, that's a good message to bring to people as long as we balance it out. I mean, if all you ever talked about was the judgments of God, you're not going to be very popular as a preacher, are you? Well, it's, it's part of the message. It's just that it's not the whole message. We must preach about the judgments of God. We must warn people to flee from the wrath to come. We must talk about God's awesome power in nature and how he can bring about his purposes and his plans using affliction, using suffering if he has to do it. And he can do it to bring people to attention and get their attention, get their ear. And yet some people are so deaf, even to the mighty thunderings of God, you know, they said that sometimes God has to use that thing to really speak to people who are so deaf to the things of God. And yet even that, uh, the, the noise and the flashes of lightning and, and peals of thunder, some people would still go on in their ways. They just continue on off the edge of the cliff, off the end, you know, they've off into destruction. Why? Because they refuse, as they, as he said in previously in the chapter, it says, if they obey and serve him, verse 11, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. And here's a, here's a warning to people who are listening today. You need to get right with God. Don't wait till it's too late. Don't say, I, I'm not really interested. I'm not interested in the things of God. But that is the fact. People are so dead. Don't listen to the things of God because they're dead and their trespasses and their sins and we need something that will wake them up and it's only god who can do that amen 
God alone who speaks to people using whatever means. But if you're going through something right now and you go, I don't understand why I'm up against the wall, why I'm facing affliction, why trouble, maybe take a step back and ask, God, is there something that I'm supposed to learn here? Am I missing something here? And God may quietly speak to you in your heart and say yes and he may point the finger on something you've done it could be many years ago it could be something re relatively new but he might put his finger on something and say you never dealt with that thing in your life and i'm dealing with it right now you need to come to a place of repentance amen of course the good news in the gospel is that those who come to repentance he will bless you he will give you new life he will forgive your sins he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness and you shall spend your days in prosperity that's not just talking about money of course i mean you're going to be prospering in every area of life a blessing from the lord uh, prosperity and years in pleasures amen we want that don't we well let's let's look forward um to the rest of this chapter and see how it all works out or the rest of the book i mean we got one more chapter to do from elihu and that's chapter 37 and thank god we thank god we thank god that it's coming to an end and finally after all this time in chapter 38 perhaps we'll read where god steps in and speaks but first of all we got one more chapter um job 37 to do next week and I close there with God's blessing and just pray that God will speak to us through this word in Jesus' name. Amen.